I'm uh, okay. Oh, yes. <laughs> Got it. Okay. We are recording this, so just so people know. So anything that's said is being recorded. And uh, we are going to be discussing education and legislation here in New Hampshire. And we have three very knowledgeable people on the subject. And um, we will cover, um, well, I'll just introduce, okay, let's start with, um, let's start, okay, let, let me go through here this. Sorry, I'm not that great with technology, so just bear with me. Um, let's see. We will be talking about education tax credits. That'll be kind of uh, Kate's uh, specialty. And then legislation, well, that's gonna be Michelle. She'll be talking about, about a particular bill. And uh, Croydon, that's uh, <laughs> Jody's uh, baby. So, uh, okay, let me back up a little bit. Okay, here we go. Okay, so, um, we have three, as I said, three, and let's, uh, okay, Kate uh, from Ch the Children's Scholarship Fund, tell us a little bit about yourself uh, before we start getting into things. Sure, thanks so much. So um, I was sitting as the board chair of a charter school eons ago, it feels like, watching those lotteries happen. Um, and, you know, 30 kids get the seats when there was hundreds of applicants wondering who was helping those kids that weren't getting into the charter schools and needed an opportunity. At the same time, my friend uh, Jim Forsyth was in the legislature and he showed me that education tax credit program. And I told him, if you could get that passed, Jim, I'll quit my job and start the scholarship fund. And I thought pigs would fly before we get passed, but sure enough, it did get passed. Um, and I quit my job in 2012 and started um, the scholarship fund in New Hampshire. Um, we're called Children's Scholarship Fund now, and I've been doing this work here now for 10 years. Okay, great. Okay, thanks. And uh, okay, and then we have Michelle uh, Lavelle. Uh, please tell us a little bit about yourself and your what brings you to this topic. <laughs> sure, happy. Thank you very much for including me. I love talking about this stuff. This is great. Um, so I am a homeschool mom myself. We started, it was a reluctant homeschool mom. Not a lot of people realize that. Uh, but I, my family has benefited from it. And I was very fortunate upon moving to New Hampshire to plug in with a bunch of really, really smart, ambitious, and excited people about all kinds of school choice things. And uh, I didn't realize how what I was getting myself into at the time, <laughs> but I became very familiar with the legislative process as well. So you put those things together and this is what happens. <laughs> kind of crazy things happen. But Granite State Home Educators is probably the largest statewide support group for homeschool families in the state. We have about 14,000 members. And you can find a bunch of our resources on our website, which is granitestatehomeeducators.org. And uh, we've got a bunch of different communities. So we help people find each other, connect, because that uh, connection and finding each other is so important to making these educational options actually stick in practice. It's not just enough to help them with knowing the how or what resources and helping them put that together. They got to find each other, find their tribe. And so we kind of do all of that in our various communities. And it's a, it's a wonderful thing. And I'm very happy to be doing this as my activism work. Oh, great, great, thank you. Okay, and then we have Jody Underwood and Jody is, uh, is our Croydon expert. And so Jody, tell us, uh, give us a little bit about your background. I hope my expertise goes beyond Croydon, but um, I, I've been on the Croydon School Board since 2010, and I've been chair on and off uh, the whole, probably half the time I've been chair, and I'm currently chair, although some people want me to resign as chair, but that's a story I'll tell later. Um, I And so one of the things that happened when I, uh, in the middle of the time I was on the board was that uh, Croydon turned into a town tuitioning town. And we had uh, an interesting battle with the state that man, Kate and, and Michelle just shepherded me through. So talk about learning about the legislative process in New Hampshire. Um, and we won, which was awesome, but that's the short version of the story. Um, 
Uh, so, and I just, as an aside, I want to say it is just, um, so I, it's been years since Kate, Michelle, and I have been on a panel together, but we used to do it all the time. So um, I'm really happy to be here with them. Um, part two of what I do is I'm on the board of the School District Governance Association, and our, our job, our mission is to help school board members discover, discover their legal powers, the powers that they're actually supposed to be doing as opposed to what they do currently. So those are areas that I know about. Great. Okay, thanks. Okay, let's move through a little bit and get into the substance here. Um, okay, Kate, this is, uh, tell us about how, how it works with the credits. And um, I myself, uh, you know, when I first moved here, I didn't know that much about it and missed out on the first year. So tell us how it works and what's available to, to people. So right on now. your slide there. Aubrey, it says, what are the education freedom accounts? And so at Children's Scholarship Now Fund now, we actually run two programs. The one that you're talking about is the education tax credit scholarship. And I'll give you a quick overview of how that works. And then I'm also going to tell you what is an education freedom account based on what you have on that slide. Okay. Oh, okay. And I know your next slide says education tax credit. So we're going backwards. And again, I'm going to do two slides at once. It sounds like regardless. <laughs> <laughs> you so can right handle now, it. You can handle it. Scholarship fund. We run two programs, the scholarship okay, program okay. that we've been running since 2012 is the education tax credit scholarship. So these two programs are two of our school choice programs in New Hampshire. We also have charter schools in New Hampshire, and that also is a form of, of school choice. And to your point, Jody's, you know, the bill, some of the towns and the town tuitioning is also a form of school choice. I would say also moving, right? When you buy a house in a district that you want to be in, that's also a form of school choice. So we run two of the school choice programs, the Education Tax Credit Scholarship Program and the Education Freedom Account Program now at Children's Scholarship Fund. The way the tax credit program works is someone can make a donation to us at Children's Scholarship Fund. And if they tell Department of Revenue before they make the donation that they want to use the tax credit and get approved, then when they make the donation to us, we can offer them a tax credit against their state tax that they would otherwise pay. It's business profits tax, business enterprise tax. And as you noticed, starting in 2018, it was interest in dividends tax also. And we've been growing by leaps and bounds, in fact. So for this fall, we've raised now $3 million for scholarships, which is about a 50% you know, increase from the year before. So we've gone from to raising $200,000 or so in 2016 to raising $3 million in 2022. So I would say that people find out about the tax credit predominantly from us at Children's Scholarship Fund first, secondarily from their accountant or someone who helps them do their um, estate planning, a financial advisor. And it's becoming more and more that accountants and financial advisors are telling people about the credit now than it was ever before. So mm. that portion is increasing. Great. But people donate and then families apply to us to get scholarships and those scholarships can be used for private school or for homeschooling expenses. So now you can go back to the other slide because we also run the program <laughs> that's called the education freedom account. And an education freedom account is the small portion of state funding um, that would follow a child to any public school, right? If they moved to towns, it would go there. It's the per pupil funding or to a charter school. Now a family can say, I want that money in a digital wallet platform with technology. You know, these days we can, we can do all these amazing things, but a family says, I want that money. And then they can use that money um, to create really diverse learning experiences for their children. They might choose to pay for a class or a course in a building or not a building. They might use online education. They, in most cases, use multiple education providers to create the education that they know works for their child. And so again, the education freedom account is that state money that would otherwise follow the child to a public school or a charter school can now follow the child into their digital wallet and they, the family directs the money. We like to say um, 
you know, like they like we're like they we give them the gas and the guardrails and they're driving the car down that road. So it's it's a really fun program. We are able to give someone both an education freedom account and a scholarship. Ooh, There's some that. discussion nationwide about these types of programs, and some people have reflected that um, our education funding in New Hampshire is low. And you know the Claremont case, and there's tons of discussions around that all the time where people don't think the state funding is enough. Well, in this particular case, if a family does need more uh, money to pay for something in particular, we can give them a scholarship and an education freedom account. So imagine you're a, a bullied child who wants to now choose your area, you know, private high school, and you know it's going to be twelve thousand dollars for tuition. You can take your education freedom account. You can also ask us for a scholarship on top of that. And then you're really getting a good part of the way towards affording your tuition, you know, at a private high school. So it's really interesting and innovative. There aren't any other states actually that operate like that. Just so you know, we are original in that regard. And it kind of makes sense, right? We're frugal in New Hampshire. You know, our the state money is, is a small piece of the child's education funding. The only piece really that they could access and you know, since the money is is not a huge amount, it makes so much sense to put money that we've raised on top of that and help a family even further. So there's your overview. How'd I do? You did great. Well, for I'm my understanding, it's around four thousand, what forty five hundred, the state portion. So is that a, is that about what you think? Yeah. And then usually, like in New Hampshire, it's about twenty thousand. That's it says it's roughly fifteen or so. That's the town portion, but we're talking about, say, 4,000 or 4,500, that's the state part of it, that's that right. that they would get for the uh, EFA, the education, is it, am I right in that? You're doing just, great. Yeah, you're doing great. Our well, I just, just so people understand the yeah. dollar amounts, because, you know, money here, money there, where's it all flowing from, and what can you use? Right. But yeah. the state part is about but that's interesting about the scholarship too. I didn't know that they could actually access both of them. That's well, a, and you know, when you're helping predominantly low and moderate income people, I mean, and they and they do want to choose a, a private school. The average cost of a New Hampshire K to twelve private school is about seventy five hundred. And so, if you take your you know four thousand dollar education freedom account, or forty two, or forty six, or whatever you want to say the average is. And then you put a scholarship on top of it, and we know our scholarship average is about 2,500, then you're getting pretty close to actually making it so that the families are covering their cost to educate in that regard. So it's, it's a really neat program. I, I love helping families, and of course, that's why I do it. And so the fact that we're raising more money, we're not able to help all the kids with an education freedom account. We do run out of scholarship money every year. We also do have some families in our scholarship program who only want to use the scholarship and don't want to use the education freedom account. And so it's really nice to be able to have choices available. Right. Okay, great. Uh, one more question. Uh, I think we're okay for time here. Um, do people know that they can use both? I yeah, they, we have much. an integrated application on our website. So when you go to apply with us, you get a drop down box in the application and it says, do you want to apply for the scholarship? Do you want to apply for the education freedom account? Or do you want to apply for both? And we do find that 90% of the families choose to apply for both. Sure, why not? And what about, should we should also talk about, there's, there's kind of an income uh, aspect to this. Obviously it's not, uh, millionaires are not going to be using. So what is it like 300? There's an argument there where, I mean, from the education freedom account perspective, right? I mean, this is the family and child's education funding that would otherwise follow them to a charter school or a public school. If it went to the public school or the charter school, it wouldn't be litmus test. It wouldn't be, it wouldn't have income limits. And so there is some discussion of, around the state about how this is the child's rightful education funding that would otherwise go to a public school or charter school. And so shouldn't it go with the family regardless of income? But either way, they did put income limits on these programs and it's 300% of the poverty yeah. line or below as it exists today. Uh, Jody, I, I know you, you got you to go ahead. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, interesting to think about it and, and I understand Kate's argument here and it's great, but the the, 
a, maybe a more general way of looking at it is either you provide education freedom accounts for everybody or just limited, or you do the same for, for government schools, right? Either, either you need the money to educate your kid or you don't. And so, you know, maybe rich parents should pay for their own kids anyway and not take poor people's money to do it. I That's always thought comment. that was weird, Jody. I used to think that, you know, like in the times when my kids went to a public school, I always had a bit of guilt, right? Because I was thinking, okay, people who don't have what I have are, are my kids are being educated on their backs. And I always thought that was really strange. Right. And I was like, okay, I would go to the grocery store and think the woman ringing up my groceries is paying for my kid to go to school. And really, I probably should have had some responsibility in that regard. Right. And somebody should have said, hey, you know, we know you can afford to pay X. So you probably should. Right. Yeah. But it doesn't work like that. But it's a very interesting discussion about and Jody and I could do like a four week series. probably. <laughs> you know? Well, I always say when it comes to taxes, no matter what, it's not fair. Somebody's going to find some aspect of it that it, it doesn't seem fair. It could should be this. It could be that. Yes, so. Fair enough. And, and you know, in this, the the intention really is to give the family access to their child's education funding that would follow the child anyway. And so it is hard for those families who say are one dollar over, right? So so when you're thinking about your single moms, okay. The single mom income limit, meaning one adult, one child, is only like $52,000. And then you're, you can't get this education freedom account or a scholarship. But if you're only earning $55,000, you don't have enough money to pay for private school. Right. And so anytime you put an income limit on something, you're choosing an arbitrary number right. that makes someone lose on the other end. And so in particular, since this money is, you know, belongs to the child, you could implement one of two ways, right, Jody? You could either, you know, say to go to a public school, you have to be 300% of the poverty line or below and, and apply it universally or vice versa, say that if you want an education freedom account, it is your child's education funding, you can use it, right? Uh, so I would add that this year, Arizona passed full access to education savings accounts, which is what they call it. Anybody. That's right. Yeah. Great. That's right. Okay. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Kate. You're, you're great. I'm, I'm glad okay, that I got to meet you at least and, and uh, hear your expertise. Let's move on here. Let me do the next slide. Uh, okay. We did that one. I'm just moving along. Oh, okay. Now we have uh, Michelle. She's going to, uh, we had a HB 1663 and Michelle was, uh, is very knowledgeable about this and was passed this past uh, legislative session. So tell us about it and, and what, how it's made things better for uh, people, for parents who want more options. Yeah, this was a really big bill for the homeschool community across the state in multiple ways. And uh, what's exciting is that 10 years ago was the last time we had deregulation of home education. And it was two, two different areas where that happened 10 years ago. And this bill, this last year, HB 1663, moved freedom forward in seven different areas. So it was massive uh, and really impactful for families. Uh, real quick explanation of what it is. Uh, we require all the districts now to adopt an equal access policy that allows resident children that are in other educational options to still be able to plug into classes or programs at their local public schools. Uh, we simplify the notification language. Uh, we removed language and simplified it so that now it expressly says, and this is a thing of beauty, so I'm going to read it. It says, home education shall be provided, and this is the new part, coordinated or directed by a parent for his or her own child. And that may seem semantics, but it's not because uh, there are districts that thought they could tell homeschool kids mm -hmm. what programs they could and could not do. Uh, or that there was some limit to how much of it had to be direct instruction by the parent. So this really was a universal change of understanding of what a home education program is. So that was massive. Uh, we also removed some unequitable academic requirements that were holdovers from previous uh, incarnations of what, how public school success was measured and that was applied to home ed. So now that's gone. 
We explicitly provide protection for children with special learning needs. Uh, so that's massive. And we say that the portfolio is the private property of the family. So lots and lots of ways we were able to move homeschool freedom forward in New Hampshire this year. So it was a big victory for us. And what was also a thing of beauty was that it went on the consent calendar for both the House and Senate, which means that they didn't object. We had bipartisan agreement on this. It was just that persuasive uh, a bill. So uh, it sailed through. It was a thing of beauty, made me cry. <laughs> so th there was really no opposition? No, we didn't have any opposition. We had, even with uh, attendance difficulties. We still had a lot of people show up. We didn't have anybody speak against our bill at either the House or the Senate hearings. Um, no, we we had bipartisan support. Really? It was, it was wonderful. So why is it they fight against, you know, other things so much and this one didn't seem to... Um, so I most of the I'll fights be... are about money. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> we weren't asking for a dime. None of this costs the taxpayers anything to implement. And so there was no money debate. There, homeschooling has become so much more mainstream because of the remote learning during the pandemic. And, and we just, honestly, I think we made compelling arguments that spoke to both the emotional and the facts uh, components of the bill. And, we had an expert from a national organization speak to the academic component, and it was very compelling. Oh, great. Is there anything, I, I'm also thinking ahead to the future, that since this battle, as, as you say, it's been 10 years since there's been uh, something major, um, where we could see more, more uh, progress uh, for parental choice in the future? Anything you saw to this a battle this year? Or what didn't seem to be a battle though? This was, I mean, part of it was we had, um, we made good friends with people on both sides of the aisle and we're able to work with them and address their concerns. There's always conversations that you need to have. So it's, nothing is ever a slam dunk. Nothing is ever guaranteed, but uh, we were able to make, uh, really good dialogue with both both sides to make this happen for the future i always see there there's improvements possible that we could make things i'd like to see different um i kind of want to see what happens with the elections we have elections coming up later this year right. see what happens there before i i stick my nose <laughs> out again uh you know that was actually one of the uh, reasons it was so good to put a homeschool bill forward this year was because Kate was so successful with the EFA bill the year before. So I'm like, if they can have $4,500 or so uh, follow the child, this is an, a favorable legislature for us to float our homeschool freedom bill. And it worked. Okay, great. So so we're guardedly optimistic and just uh, waiting for, uh, see how things turn out in this election before uh, trying to pr um, push forward more uh, parent-friendly legislation, sounds like. Well, there are always a few things I have up my sleeve <laughs> on homeschool issues. If we have a, the right environment to do it, um, we'll have to see what happens. I mean, Here's a good example. Public schools, Jody will be able to confirm this for me. They have testing in grades three, eight, and 11 for their biggest statewide assessments, but homeschoolers have to do it every single year. You know, why is that? Public schools do three through eight and then 11. Yeah. Actually. So we, we could reduce it for homeschooling. Why not? Should be the same. Why would should it be different? Well, the so. parents should decide. It shouldn't be the same at all, but. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you're going to have yeah. one, why, why more strict for um, one set than the other? That's yeah. a, obviously doesn't yeah. seem very fair to me yeah. from a fairness viewpoint. Forget, you know, the yeah. common sense. Yeah. So those are the sorts of things I look at. I look for those disparities where our homeschoolers asked to do more or achieve more or pr produce more um, uh, evidence. Uh, above and beyond what 
the public schools have to do. So I, I look for those discrepancies. Yeah, the 40% percentile, that was like unbelievable. Yeah, I, I right? Can't see. <laughs> Yeah. that. So yeah. you, I'm uh, hoping nobody argued against that one. Nope. I had everybody great. nodding their head. Oh, this makes perfect sense. I'm like, okay, oh, that was great. Okay. Well, we will look forward to you uh, uh, pushing forward and, uh, and your expertise and uh, uh, advocacy for the parents. So great. My pleasure. Actually, Michelle, okay. did you explain that 40%? here today? I no, I did. didn't. I didn't. Um, so previously, before this latest bill passed, uh, homeschoolers had three, well, they still have three broad categories of how they can do their annual assessments, a standardized test, a teacher evaluation, or something else that shows the child's progress. And at that time, it said progress commensurate with age or abil and ability. And so that language we also fixed in the bill. Uh, and if the family had selected some sort of standardized test, they were required to achieve at least the 40th percentile or above on that test for their child. Um, we got rid of it. I mean, even the public schools don't have to reach that as an aggregate score, and they certainly don't for the, each individual child. So we're like, it, this was a holdover language from many, many years ago with the public schools and grade level expectations, and those have been out for over a decade. So we're like, it's time to remove that language from the home ed bill. And th the standard is still progress commensurate with age and ability. Now it says, and or disability. So that's where we were able to get the explicit protection for children who have special learning differences. And so it, it, you still have to show progress, but that how you show that evidence can be any number of ways. And the parents are in charge of selecting what is the best reflection of that progress. But Michelle, do they have to actually show that information to anybody? Uh, the, it goes in their portfolio, which now remains their private property. Mm -hmm. And that portfolio can be the basis for that teacher evaluation. But no, they keep that private. That was something that was changed in 2012. That's so that you didn't have to show evidence and prove to some entity that your child was learning. Uh, that was another one of those unequitable standards that we removed 10 years ago. Uh, but parents are able to use that information to adjust their own instructional process for their kids, you know, make, see how their kids are doing. And they often use that to prepare a transcript if that's required for any additional programs in the future that the kids may want to take. But it, uh, it all remains private property. Mm -hmm. um, it can be, we usually encourage families to look for placement tests or or prepare transcripts or things like that, should they be entering another educational environment where that information is necessary. So uh -huh. if, I'm sorry, no, so if, if I understand correctly then, they're required to have their kids take tests in the years that you mentioned yep. or do a portfolio or something like that, um, but they're not required at all to share that information with anybody. They don't have to prove to anybody that their kids are making progress, but it's a good idea for them to do so for the reasons you also stated. I mean, yes, for all those reasons, for if they are trying to get into another program, future transcripts, whether it's for applying to a competitive high school or, you know, college for college, that's all helpful. Uh, families also use that as their body of evidence, should they ever have a truancy officer knocking on their door mm -hmm. or a DCYF person that doesn't happen often. I don't want to scare folks, but it does happen. And in today's environment, we have more superintendents worried about those kids playing on their in their backyard on school days. And so we are seeing increases of truancy officers or at least inquiries being made to the districts. Mm -hmm. And so this is that body of evidence that a family can say, no, I'm, we're good. We are homeschooling and we have our documentation lined up should they ever have a question about it. Okay. Okay, great. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Michelle. Great. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay. And thank you for the work that you do, of course. Uh, okay, let's move on here. Let me, uh, okay, Jody. <laughs> Croydon, <laughs> tell us about what's going on in Croydon and beyond. Sure. So by this, they mean the budget situation that happened this year. 
because um, court and decision used to mean something different, right? Um, <laughs> um, so I'm going to try to do this as quickly as possible. Um, so anybody, so we have a, a traditional town meeting in Croydon, we're a small town, and we do our votes at our town meeting, where larger towns and cities, they vote at, uh, you know, they do it differently. They have deliberatives and then vote offline. Um, so at a, at a traditional town meeting, anybody can get up and propose a change in the budget for, well, not just town meeting, sorry, this is about the annual district meeting. Um, and so uh, that's what my husband did. Um, so we propose, I'm, I'm, I'm chair of the school board. Yeah. And there's my husband, he hears me talk about him and he's talking no. in the background. <laughs> um, he, um, we proposed a $1.7 million budget, which to be honest, I wasn't that happy about. Our budget had risen 30% in the last few years, and I, I couldn't figure out a way to lower that. Um, and so, you know, I did propose it at the meeting. I did vote for it, which, you know, it probably shouldn't have in hindsight, but details. Um, and the attendees at the annual district meeting voted for, oh, sorry. So my husband got up and proposed uh, $10,000 per student as a cap for the budget approximated to 80 kids, it comes to $800,000, which is 54% of the proposed budget. And he presented many very good reasons as to why he wanted to do this, um, that you couldn't just cut back on a budget to really start addressing how should you be educating kids? What's the best use of, use of public money for educating children? Um, it, it, I mean, it's the tax dollars, it's everybody's tax dollars and we should all be thinking about it. Just like Kate said before, right? Nobody's thinking about this stuff. So that was his reasoning for it. That, and then there's more stuff too, right? Over the last 50 years, if you look at the data, you could see that it doesn't matter how much you spend on students. Um, you can spend $7,000 per kid and get the full range of academic achievement. You can spend $20,000 per kid and get the full range of academic achievement. So clearly the amount of money you spend really has no bearing on how well kids do or you know, how much they learn in school. So he presented all that in a pamphlet and the town voted on it and voted for the $800,000 budget. Um, and every, when you read about it in the news, they tell you it was all Ian and me, we did it all. Yeah, we, I mean, we didn't force anybody to vote for this and I had nothing to do with it. I mean, I was on the board and I actually supported it. Um, but I, I didn't, you know, it wasn't my idea. It was Ian's and anybody who knows Ian knows that he thinks of things like this. Um, so, so that happened. And then a group in town was really angry and organized a group called Stand Up for Croydon Students. And they had support from progressive groups, as it turns out, Granite State Progress, the, uh, the teachers union, the NEA gave them support. So um, they had a full out campaign to knock our character into the gutter and not discussing the issues at all that really needed to be discussed. They, um, they bullied people to sign petitions, not everybody, right? But they also scared them. They used what I call a fear and smear campaign. So they scared them. They told them that if our, this lower budget happens that their house prices are gonna go down and their taxes are gonna go up. And you know, it couldn't, neither could be the op further from the opposite of the truth. Um, so, so they, I mean, they had a tall order in front of them. They had to get 50% uh, of the registered voters to show up on a on another day, so they had a petitioned district meeting that they were able to find a law that that got them there um, that nobody knew about. That was also interesting. Um, there were so many interesting parts to this, but um, so they had this meeting and they they got their quorum, but nobody in town who wanted to vote for the eight hundred thousand dollar budget. Um, nobody thought they were gonna get the quorum. They needed 283 people, I believe it was. So we're a town of 800, right? So the numbers are pretty low. Um, and they ended up getting 379 people to cast ballots. Only two of them were against. So it was 377 to two, which sounds like a landslide until you realize that 40% of the people specifically didn't show up to the meeting because they didn't want to add to the quorum. So it was 60, 40. 
many people voting because they didn't want their house values to go down and because they thought Ian and I were evil and because so many different reasons. Some just didn't want the village school to shut down, which it wasn't going to do, right? There were so many things that they told their kids. I mean, these parents modeled for their kids that if you bully and lie, you'll get what you want. So they told their kids that, so the program we were proposing for the $800,000 budget, which took us a couple of months to come up with because Ian didn't have a plan for this as he points out. Um, and the town wasn't helping us and neither was our administration. They, and I quote, they couldn't imagine how they could possibly run a school district on that budget. So it was up to the school board to actually do it, which isn't really our jobs, but that's what we did. And uh, we came up with micro schools. Um, and it, and it was actually a pretty reasonable um, approach to doing things. Uh, and we, we believe that the students would all do better academically. They'd have more individualized attention if you went through micro schools um, and they would have been face-to-face -face micro schools. So there would have been other activities as well. There'd be project-based learning. There'd be all sorts of stuff, especially for the lower aged kids. Um, and one, one person got up who was on the side of the lower budget and said, you know, you were all against school choice when, when we brought it to the town a number of years ago. And then most of you have turned, come around and realized school choice is really good for the kids. Don't you think this is gonna happen here too? But nobody wanted to listen to that because really it was a shock to them. And that's why they were angry. And I understand that, I really do. Um, so, so micro schools, what did they tell their kids about micro schools? They told them it was gonna be just like remote learning during COVID, which again, couldn't be further from the truth. So there's some online learning that happens, but it wasn't remote sitting and locking yourself in a house, not allowed to go out, right? And having a teacher online talk to you like they would in a classroom. I mean, it's not the same at all. So they got their vote and, um, and I mean, that's that, that's the story. So we're, we're back to the status quo at the moment. Um, but we're still trying to do some good things and, and uh, help improve the academic performance in our schools. What what do you think could have been done differently? No, look at hindsight now, because you've said, oh, you know, this and that. Sure. So hindsight, what 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 wisdom do you have from that? Sure. So a number of people have given me their hindsight, which they think they would have had these uh, these thoughts before that you should always go and vote. You shouldn't just stay home. Um, but, you know, had they been asked before, I don't think they would have thought that, um, that, 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 that 50% number was high. Oh, and why do I say it was high? Because we have never had that kind of turnout for any election, even when it wasn't that you had to be there at that date. Like, you know, when you go to the ballot, it just has never been. So getting that many people out was a huge battle. So that's, so I, I guess that's not a real hindsight thing. I think I would have done the same thing and stayed home. Um, or not cast the ballot anyway. Um, but the other thing is to introduce the ideas of, let's say, micro schools, to introduce these more, what you might call philosophical issues about whether we're doing the right thing for the students by having them in environments like Newport schools, which their elementary is the bottom in the state. Their, uh, their middle school is like third from the bottom. Their high school is a little higher, but not much their graduation rate of, sorry, not the graduation rate, they have a 90 whatever percent graduation rate, but the proficiency level for reading and math is also very, very low. Um, is that a school that we wanna send our kids to? And start that conversation and get people on board for understanding that, wow, we are not doing the best thing for our kids. Then you start introducing more innovative ways to teach them. And you, because yeah, just doing something so radically without getting the town on board I think um, was probably not the best thing to do. Okay, so li little steps moving forward, or uh, or what do you think? Well, no, you can't do little steps. Uh, you, again, you can't just cut back to get to a different model. You have to do something completely different. But it's the conversation that is important to get people to understand that we know better ways to educate people and what they're doing right now in, in schools in government schools are not the best way to teach kids they're just or anyone for that matter i mean as an well it doesn't matter they're just not we know a lot i'm a learning scientist so my day job is also learning this is what my life is is focusing on how people learn 
You have to meet people where they are to take them where they want to be. You know, how, how can you make a kid who doesn't want to learn, learn something? And how can you stop someone who wants to learn from learning? You can't, both, you know, both questions need to be considered. Um, are the opponents uh, of uh, school choice or the parents who are uh, making the big fuss, um, are they receptive to any of those ideas? Well, a, dis a discussion about it. Not at the moment, because they're still angry, right? Yeah. Because they think Ian and I are both evil um, and anything we say must be wrong, right? Um, they're still on character assassination. That's what they're doing. They're, they're, I mean, they're campaigning. One woman who was one of the um, organizers for a stand up, um, she's running for state rep, she's a Democrat. Um, and she's going around telling them how, what evil people Ian, Ian and Jody Underwood are. Um, that's her campaign strategy. Uh, and she's gonna do better for, for the people of Croydon and all around the area. Yeah, but Kate, okay, did you have something? I was just going to chime in and say that I do think in general that people are beginning to understand that one size fits all is not a talking point, right? That that is real. The experience that so many people had when they were at home um, and their public schools were closed and they were trying to find options, I think did flip some switches, right? It kind of threw back the curtain. And in so many cases, I found people after that point understanding so much more clearly what I've been doing this whole time, right? And so I do feel like there has been a shift in public perception and knowledge of about why people should have more options. And I think that comes with that perhaps some knowledge too that, you know, that we should be trying to work to meet individual child's needs and not just you know, funding buildings or, you know, it did kind of make people question that the fact that we were funding buildings before, but then there weren't any children in the buildings anymore, right? And so mm. that gave some people pause to think, hmm, maybe we should be thinking about doing things differently. So I think there's a, there's a slight inclination more than there was before the pandemic around that space whether or not everyone wants to embrace that is a whole different discussion to Jody's point, but I am seeing people more open to understanding, um, individualizing things. Yeah, mm -hmm. maybe it would have been, you know, quite the opportunity to take it from there and go in this direction. Like, look what the, you know, what this remote learning thing did, what, uh, what could we do differently and make right. it better? Yeah, that's right. It, it seemed like they were using though that against, uh, they were saying the micro schools, they, oh, see remote, that's what you're trying to do. But you're, you're saying that was complete uh, fabrication. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, they turned it to they turned their own narrative on, and it really had very little to do with reality. Yeah. How about like the proficiency scores? I mean, I always harp on that on our school district. They're so bad, and mine is is an really average. Care about scores. I don't think people really care about scores in general. It seems like it's not necessarily really? some. It's not really the reason that people choose schools. It seems like they choose a school really for the climate and culture at the school. I, I just, in my experience, people are not necessarily using test scores as a litmus test for good or bad. Right, um, mm -hmm. and what, what the, uh, the school professionals will tell you is you can't just use one data point to say how well a school is doing or how students are doing. And that's correct, but it's just, it is a, you know, um, well, you know what? It's what the government is telling them how to do it, right? So maybe they need to do something different to rate the schools. But right now we're using what they use to rate their schools. Um, but then the other point, I mean, Kate, I mean, we, you, you talk about that, what the parents in town um, told us multiple times when we asked them what they valued in their current schools so we could come up with something that would appeal to them the only thing they said multiple times was sports and friends and extracurricular activities. They didn't huh. know how to provide extracurricular activities for their kids if the schools didn't do it. And what they're um, saying yep. is climate and culture to me. That's they're saying climate and culture, right? They're saying a community environment where my kid has fun and has activities to participate where you know everybody goes to the football games so they're talking about climate and culture really and they not don't going know to the football to games that, right they don't know right. how to say but, climate and culture 
Yeah. Um, right. So they give the examples to let me know that goes beyond that. It's the it's so their kids can participate in the sports. So why is that poor family funding sports for their kids? Right. That's the conversation that I mean, that's just so wrong. They should be. Yes. Provide. I mean, I mean, let's talk about how, but they should be providing an environment for everybody to be able to learn, to read, to write, to think. Right. Um, and when it goes beyond that, why is that? Why are public dollars, I, public dollars is just yeah. the wrong term. Why are tax dollars being used for it, right? Well, this is a big part of what we do with GSHE is not just the how or how to help families devise an education plan that fits their kids' needs, but it's the social, emotional connection that they want. It's the friendships. It's the 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 other parts of life that make it rich and make it stick. And so, I mean, we work really hard at cultivating that component for people, because once you uh, are disengaged from the public school system, it's the children and the parents who often have now lost that social structure that they're so accustomed to. And they're used to it all being within you know, a very small geographic area surrounding their home. So we tell them, you know, the whole world is available to them for academics and anybody in the state can become your new best friend. Uh, and so we help them plug in, but it's that, that component is super important to both the kids and the adults. And, you know, it, it, it matters. I think that's where, um, if it's going to be successful and stick with them, it's not just the academics that we focus on. It's also, as Kate calls it, the, the culture and the climate. Amazing. <laughs> All that money spent to educate kids and it's actually the extracurricular stuff that uh, people are really interested in and spending all that fortune. Yeah, it's to me unbelievable. But I anyway. do have a question, if you don't mind. Jody, oh, no, I'm no. Jody, I'm wondering what was the per pupil cost in your town in the pre budget before that discussion? What were you spending per pupil? Are we still are? Um, <laughs> um, so, taken as a whole budget and dividing by the number, it was about 23, well, actually, just for Corden Village School, it was about 23,000 per kid. Um, that's K to four. And then our tuition rates, for, which is what we do from five through 12, um, Newport had just increased us by 11% just in this last year uh, to be just shy of $18,000. And that's the high level and that's the amount we guarantee for tuition, that's our base. If, if there's another school like KUA, for example, that's more than that, the parents are responsible for the extra. Okay. So, Sunapee's lower. Um, Jody, do you want to just um, maybe just quickly tell us a little bit about the other crowing one, not the whole thing, but, you know, just about tuitioning, how that part works, just so people know a little bit about that. It is, sure. it is very cool. Town tuitioning, yeah. Well, this is traditional. This is New England. This has been going on for 150 years. Um, if, you, if your district doesn't provide the grades, you're allowed to tuition out your kids to neighboring schools. And from the beginning, it included private schools. Um, this is true in Vermont and Maine, so Northern New Hampshire tradition. Although I think they did it in Massachusetts as well. And I think Mass has more school choice than we do too, but I digress. Um, uh, so if you can tuition kids out to, to nearby schools. In around 1950 in, in, in New Hampshire, uh, they, they, created a law that well they, they modified the laws um to say well the interpretation was that you couldn't send your kids to private schools anymore um using town tuitioning and so but it was weird if you live in a border town of vermont or maine you could still send your kids to private schools on the other states using town tuitioning that was okay that's not actually written in a law anywhere but the then commissioner Virginia Barry said, but it's just an understanding that we have that this is great, that we respect what those states do. And since they send their kids to private schools as part of a tuitioning program, we would do that too. And then I said, so some people in Vermont send their kids to KUA in New Hampshire using town tuitioning. And she just kind of stuttered for a minute um, and said, well, that's different. That's in New Hampshire. So which is it? We respect, we don't respect. Anyway, we, um, 
they, sorry, the sun is in my eyes. Um, <laughs> I had that problem too. <laughs> yeah, suddenly. Um, so so uh, the State Department of Ed actually took us to court over that because at first they approved it and then they decided not to. It was fascinating experience. Um, and the, the court, you know what? I don't even wanna go there. We shepherded a bill through the legislature to, to roll back the laws to allow private schools um, and, and that took two, two rounds to get through, actually. It didn't work the first year, um, but then the second year it went back and we were able to, um, to get that passed. And that was awesome because last year when the, when the um, US Supreme Court um, had a ruling that said, if you send kids to private schools on tax dollars that you also must consider or offer religious schools as a choice. Mm -hmm because otherwise it's discrimination. So now Croydon has the, um, it's funny, this didn't get into like national papers, but you know, it was totally national papers back then. Um, we were the first town in New Hampshire to um, allow parents to choose religious schools as well last year for the first time, this year, this past year for the first time. Great. So that, that is all fun and yeah, and good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank. Thank you for explaining that. Uh, Amy, you want to, I'll turn that over to you for the, for the questions. I don't have any questions in the chat. Um, Reagan might have some that she wants to chime in with. Okay. You're well, muted, Reagan. Okay. Um, you're still muted. <laughs> yeah, Reagan, you're still muted. So I, yeah, I'm not muted now. Uh, so I don't have any questions, but I got a very good picture of this whole thing. I mean, I'm almost from zero to one. So I started at zero and I'm at least at maybe one or two, step one or two, but you did it so well that I have a frame around it. So now I have a file folder in my head, maybe a couple. And so the, it's not just data. Uh, so you did beautifully. I appreciate it. Uh, I, I have a question here. Okay, uh, it's a long one. Not it's a parental bill of rights. So everybody knows about this one here in New Hampshire. Uh, it didn't make it. Uh, it got close. Uh, what do you the, the three, What do you guys think about the chance of it next year? Uh, what do you think about it? If anybody I has actually, any? I honestly did not read it. So I can't speak to the bill because I actually did not read that one. No oh, okay. Thing, right? And I'm usually good at that stuff, but I'm too busy, you know, running the programs to read anything right now. What I'm hearing from the legislature is that they felt like it needed more work and that's why it didn't pass. And they said they'll continue to work on some of the nuances of it next year. Okay. Uh, Michelle, any thoughts on that one? I mean, I think it was kind of a biggie one. But it, uh, at least from the folks I hang out with, but it just uh, it didn't go. And uh, I think it was because of the whole, you know, sexual identity thing and all that business, you know, that don't say gay or don't talk to your, if you tell your teacher about it, and then they are supposed to tell the parents and, you know, that, that kind of issue thing. Uh, I think that's what killed it myself. But um, anybody have any more thoughts about that one? Yeah. Well, I mean, just to state it, Michelle said this earlier, it really depends on the elections this year, right? And it wasn't just um, the, uh, uh, I'm just losing the word, trans, the trans issues and pronouns right, right. and whatnot, but it was also related to CRT um, and, uh, you know, teaching kids to be racist in order to not be racist. Um, and, but, you know, this is sort of, it's a rift, it's split, right? Uh, you know, one quote side um, wants the schools to teach this stuff and the other side doesn't. So where does that go? I mean, it's, can we just separate it out and have two separate and not use tax dollars at all? Right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, my experience in running for the school board is the CRT. <laughs> they said, how do you feel about CRT? There was definite opposition to the folks I, I spoke to at least, but um, 
anyway, I don't uh, really see them in our school district. Um, if they're doing it with the CRT, it's, uh, it's definitely under the radar because even our uh, school district knows, the uh, school board members, that this is kind of a no-no. So I, I don't know. It's, but it's done insidiously. It's done through math questions by using examples that imply racism, that it, it, it's just introducing terms at a younger age that you wouldn't normally introduce to kids at that age. Well, I would just say, just to, to, to maybe close out the discussion, I mean, if we give parents the opportunity to choose any school that they want their child to attend, course, yeah. then they can make those decisions based on, you know, if we have transparency around schools and we have the ability for someone to say, I like this and I don't like that and to vote with their feet, then I think we solve some of those challenges because then you'll have people choosing the things that are the best match for them and the best match for their children. And perhaps we wouldn't have so many debates about you know, a, a piece of paper, right? Or debating a discussion of, of curriculum, rather the parents would say, I like this and I'm gonna stay, or I don't like it and I'm, I'm gonna choose something else. And, and that would be a direct signal to people providing education, what type of education they should provide. Well, school choice, that's, that's why we love it. <laughs> so we want more of it, but it's the funding, of course. Okay, well, um, if there are no other questions, I definitely- Can I ask one question? You certainly can. Real quick. Now that you brought up that subject, I, and I'm wondering, when you talk about CRT, are you finding an agreement as to what it really means that the elements of it, because I, I wonder how many people are, from the goodness of their heart, they think we need what they think CRT is. I mean, talk to people about equity. Uh, good meaning, well-meaning Democratic friends of mine, they don't see it as equal outcomes. But I believe it is, according to what I've read in the uh, from scholars or primary um sources it, it, no, I, I'm just gonna, I just need to jump in here we're at time so oh, okay. um maybe we can carry on the conversation another time okay <laughs> there's Amy okay I guess <laughs> okay okay well thank you all very much I really appreciate it. I enjoyed the discussion and maybe we can do it again sometime on a slightly different angle that's great. thanks for having me okay, thank, thank you